What is up, YouTube? My name is Gio, and Superman and Lois is incredible. I'll be honest, when this show was first announced, I was terrified. At the time, The Flash was on a downward spiral, Supergirl was nothing to write home about, and we just suffered through season 1 of Batwoman. So, saying that I was worried that the CW would ruin Superman would be a pretty big understatement. But, I am so happy to say that I was 100% wrong to worry. This show has great writing, amazing characters, and while it's not perfect, it's definitely the most standout show within the Arrowverse. But, you may be wondering, what specifically makes this show so great? Well, sit back as I explain why Superman and Lois is the best show on the CW. And if you end up enjoying the video, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell so you're always notified when I release new content and it helps with algorithm stuff. Also, if you want to follow me on all social medias or join the Discord, the link will be in the description down below. Anyway, let's start with something that I think many people overlook when talking about the Arrowverse shows, that being the episode count. An average season for these series are about 20 to 22 episodes, and it has become abundantly clear to me that that is way too many. The reason I say this is because it has led to many of these shows having either a bunch of filler that doesn't move the plot forward in any meaningful way, or stretches out the conflict well past its expiration date. The Flash is the best example of this. Season 7 has 5 episodes to where nothing happens that pushes the main plot forward, or has a lasting effect throughout the season. Season 5 had a villain that should have been caught by episode 8, but ends up having its conflict stretched out for 7 more episodes. This makes the viewing experience feel like a drag, as a lot of the time you are just given pointless information. These shows are making the plot fit the episode count when it should be the other way around. With Superman and Lois, every episode has a role in the season's overarching story and pushes the plot forward at a great pace. Now to understand what I mean by this for people who haven't seen the show, I'm going to be going over the general plot of the season so you guys have some baseline knowledge. Obviously there will be spoilers and this is going to take a bit so bear with me. We start the season with a narration from Clark going over his origin. Krypton is a dying planet, a family sends their only son out in a ship to escape, kid lands outside a farm in Smallville, Kansas, is adopted by the Kents, and as the boy grows up, he discovers that he has powers. We, we all know the story. But unlike most interpretations, this time around we get to see more of his life. Pa Kent dying due to a heart attack, Clark saving his first person as Superman, meeting and marrying Lois Lane, and eventually having two kids named Jonathan and Jordan. Now Clark and his family live in Metropolis, as he has to try and balance being Superman and a father. This flashback was a perfect way to establish the world we are in and define our characters in a very efficient way. We learn everything we need to know about Clark from these quick scenes, so now we have time to focus on other characters like the boys. We see Jonathan is more upbeat and positive, while Jordan has anxiety, he secludes himself from everyone, and doesn't seem to be too confident. These traits are later reinforced through their interactions with their dad. Oh, don't worry about them. Worry? That's awesome. You should have seen their faces. <laughs> um, dad. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. One duct tape due to a tractor. Yeah, life's a little different in the Smallville than it is Metropolis. Okay, well, I, I mean, you know, if you, if you need anything, if you want to go on talk, I'm here. Your dad? Yeah. The music? After we wrap up our character introduction, we see Clark is helping Lois' father, Sam, who is the head of the DoD, at a nuclear factory before heading home. Once he gets there, Lois informs Clark that he missed Jordan's therapy appointment, but she covers for him, establishing that the boys don't know Clark is Superman. This leads to him confiding in his mother. This is the first chance we get to see his insecurities about having to balance his life at home and as Superman. Martha is very understanding to this, but she tells him that he has a bigger responsibility now. Mom, I, uh, I, I do have a responsibility to the world as you know who. Well, you've got a bigger responsibility to your family as a father. The boys need to see what a strong and loving and vulnerable man looks like. What your father was to you. Unfortunately, things get much worse for Clark before they get better. Due to a businessman named Morgan Edge buying the Daily Planet, Clark gets fired and later finds out that his mother has had a stroke and passes away before Clark can even get there. Now I'd like to divert our course for a second to point out how important it is when killing off Jonathan or Martha Kent for it to be from natural causes. 
Superman is an incredibly powerful character, so with very few exceptions, to have his parents die from something like being kidnapped, mugged, or by a goddamn tornado makes it a lot harder to believe given his abilities. Something like a heart attack or a stroke gives away to humble Clark and remind him that no matter how hard he tries, there are going to be some people that he just cannot save. After the funeral, we are introduced to Lana Lang and her family as they reconnect with Clark and Lois. While their daughter Sarah talks with the boys, the adults catch up, and we learn that Morgan Edge has taken an interest in Smallville, more specifically, the mines, and wants to set up shop in town. In return, he promises to bring well-paying jobs to the people. Lana's husband Kyle is all for this, and has been pushing for it hard at the town hall. He informs the Kents that many people in Smallville are barely surviving, and Edge is offering a chance to help these families put food on their plates again. However, Lois is very suspicious of this, and believes Edge may have some ulterior motive, much to Kyle's annoyance. Well, look, Peggy, we'll uh, at least get a lifeline if this whole Edge proposal goes through right. It's gonna put a lot of folks back to work around here. Until it doesn't, Edge's companies prey on struggling communities. See, people like you, you, you look at Smallville, and, and you think of the past, and you feel a little bad for us, right? People like Morgan Edge, though, now, see, he looks at Smallville and he sees the future. What I think is great about this scene in particular is that the show doesn't try to make Kyle out to be the bad guy for wanting Edge to stay in town. Rather, he's just trying to help a struggling Smallville as much as he can. With recent shows putting the villain tag on characters that clearly don't deserve it, it is nice to have more of a nuanced take here. Meanwhile, with the kids, in an effort to try and fix the Wi-Fi, the boys seemingly get crushed by a bunch of pipes. However, by some miracle, they only have minor concussions. This leads to Clark and Lois suspecting that at least one of them has powers, and at the same time, it makes Jordan suspicious on how the hell they are even alive. So he convinces Jonathan to search the barn with him the next day, while his parents are at the bank. During their investigation of the barn, they end up finding Clark's ship, and go to confront their parents about it. Knowing that they can't hide it anymore, Clark tells the boys that he is Superman, and suspects one of them has powers. This angers Jordan and Jonathan, as they feel like they have been lied to for years, so they leave to blow off some steam. Clark barely gets any time to process this, as Sam tells them that the man responsible for the meltdown at the nuclear factory has been found. So Clark suits up to confront the stranger. Meanwhile with the boys, they end up getting into a fight with the whole football team, and this ends up triggering Jordan's powers as he shoots a beam of heat vision exploding the bonfire. Cut back to Superman and the Stranger, and it's revealed that this armored man knows all about Superman's Kryptonian origin, including his weakness to Kryptonite. And once he sees his opportunity, he strikes. <laughs> and here's where the first inconsistency with the plot comes in. In later episodes, we find out that this Stranger is supposed to be hell-bent on killing Superman, so my question is, why the hell didn't he just stab him in the head? If we're going to make the argument that the blade was too short to reach and pierce Superman's heart, which doesn't make any sense to me either, but f it, let's roll with it, going for a headshot should finish the job. This could easily be fixed by having Superman start to gain the upper hand on the stranger, so then he ends up using the kryptonite out of desperation rather than stupidity. This scene will have the same outcome, except it wouldn't be contradicted by later episodes. Anyway, Superman eventually builds up enough strength to yank out the kryptonite, and goes to investigate what happened with the boys, where he learns about Jordan's powers. With all this going on, Clark and Lois are kinda at a loss on what to do, but Clark remembers the last thing he heard his mother say before she died was to come home. He believes she meant to bring the family to Smallville, as it would allow him to spend more time with them, and now with Jordan's powers, it will make it easier to keep an eye on him. The family eventually agrees with this, so with that, the Kents have decided to stay in Smallville, and the episode ends with us seeing the stranger be referred to as Captain Luthor. This first episode does a great job at establishing the world, characters, and setting up the conflict for the rest of the series. Throughout this season, we see how the family is adjusting to Smallville, Jordan developing his powers at an admittedly slow rate, Lois doing a deeper investigation into Morgan Edge, and Clark continuing to help Sam in order to figure out the identity of the stranger. Eventually, people start showing up around Smallville with powers similar to Superman, and leads to Captain Luthor trying to help Lois in her investigation. He tells her he is a reporter and gets them access to the mines, where we learn that not only does Edge's assistant have powers, but Edge himself is using the mines to stockpile a mineral called X-Kryptonite 
which has the ability to give people powers under the right circumstances. It starts to become abundantly clear to Lois that Captain Luthor knows more than what he says, so through some journalistic interrogation and a bit of snooping of his van by Clark, they both discover that the man is a Luthor, a Luthor who doesn't believe in setting up security before leaving his van. After some discourse between the three, they agree to set up a meeting with Superman, but it ends up being a trap as the man uses red solar tech in order to depower Superman, and reveals to him that he was the stranger from the start of the season. We also learn that rather than being a Luthor, the man's real name is John Henry Irons, and he is here to kill Superman before he takes over the world. However, before he can do any permanent damage to the Man of Steel, Jordan and Jonathan save Superman, and John Irons is sent to a DoD prison. Our characters are eventually told that John Irons is from another Earth, where Superman went rogue, and it seems as if history is repeating itself on this earth. It's also finally confirmed to our characters that Edge is building an army, but he's creating it by somehow putting Kryptonian consciousnesses into the people of Smallville. And the cherry on top of this shitty new Sunday is it turns out that on John Iron's earth, he was married to Lois and had a kid named Natalie. Lois takes this relatively hard as she and Clark were expecting to have a daughter after the boys, but unfortunately, they lost the baby. After taking some time to process this information, Lois eventually uses this connection with John Irons as a way to convince him that Superman won't turn. Suit yourself. John, I know about Natalie. I know what happened on your world. It's your family. Then you know why I have to do this. Please, I see the anger in your eyes. It's covering something I can relate to. The torture that comes from wondering if you failed. If there was something you could have done to save them, but there wasn't. If there had been, you would have found it. John, our worlds are different. Our Superman is good. He would never turn on us, ever. How can you know that? I know. And if you kill him, an innocent man, a hero, what does that make you? With John Irons no longer believing that Superman is an immediate threat, and with Clark and Lois's permission, the DoD agreed to release him. However, because the Kents just can't catch a break, Edge has mobilized a couple members of his army, one of which being a mind control Kyle, and has them attack Lois and John. Luckily, with Lana warning Lois about one of them acting out of character, and Sam holding them off for a bit, it gives Jonathan and Lois enough time for them to get to the barn and activate the ETF, so Superman can come and save them. But somehow, they all escape. Don't ask me how, the show never explains. One of the last things we see is Kyle getting back to his family and eventually confiding in Lana. I'm trying to improve myself, Lana. I really am. But something happened to me tonight. I was I was at the performance and, 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 and we were talking to Sarah and, and then I blacked out. Next thing you know, I'm out in the middle of a field somewhere outside of town and my, my ribs are hurting and, and I don't know how I got there. I don't know what's going on. The steps you're taking to improve yourself. Did Morgan Edge make you an offer? Back with the Kents, we learn that the reason Edge is staying in Smallville is because the townspeople who grew up here had prolonged exposure to X-Kryptonite, which makes it so the Kryptonian consciousness can become stable when implanted into them. The episode ends with someone using Lois's stolen ETF. Superman goes to investigate this and finds that it's Morgan Edge, only to have it revealed that Edge is not just Kryptonian, but is also Superman's half-brother. Edge tries to use this revelation as a way to convince Superman to join him, but Clark is having none of it. After a quick fight, Clark goes back home to explain to his family about Edge and him wanting to turn Earth into the next Krypton. So in search of more answers, he goes to the fortress to talk to Jor-El. He tells Clark that Edge was able to transfer Kryptonian consciousness through a device his mother made. It has similar properties to the crystal that creates hologram Jor-El and Lara's original intention was to preserve Kryptonian culture, not use it to destroy a planet's people. Which kinda sends mixed signals when you realize that this device is called the Eradicator. Yeah, the marketing department really sh** bet on that one. Back at Smallville, Lois goes to check on Lana, not knowing that Kyle is there. The moment he sees her, the Kryptonian consciousness kicks in and he attacks. Luckily, Lois was prepared for this and came with Kryptonite, allowing the DoD to take him into custody. It's so nice to see characters actually thinking before doing something, cause you know if this was in any other CW show, Lois would have gone in there unprepared. 
Anyway, she explains to Lana what's going on and asks if she may know anything, as earlier in the season, Edge gave her a high up job in the Smallville branch of his company. Lana tells her that she should look into Edge's personal doctor, and upon further investigation, the DoD was able to find him with the machine that they've been using to turn people. However, he tells them that only the creator of this device would know how to reverse the effects. This leads to Clark coming up with the idea to use the scientist to put Laura's consciousness into someone so she can reverse the effects of the Eradicator. And after seeing what Edge has done to Smallville, Lana volunteers as she feels responsible. So she goes through the process successfully, and now, it's time to get to work. At the same time, Edge finds that his lab has been ransacked by the DoD, so he accelerates his plan to mobilize his army. Meanwhile, after Clark gets to talk to his Kryptonian mother for the first time, Laura explains how the Eradicator works. Same principle as a computer. In this case, instead of a computer, it's a brain, and the information being uploaded is a person's consciousness. The Eradicator holds and transfers this information. How long does that take? Days, weeks, depends how willing the host is to accept this new life, if at all. The Kryptonian consciousness will remain in the Eradicator and their powers will dissipate over time. And how do we stop this? We just need to get the people who were affected to go through the eradication process again. But we don't know how many people have gone through this. There has to be another way to do it all at once. That would require too much energy. However, this explanation is cut short, as Superman goes to meet Edge and try to appeal to him as a brother in hopes that he doesn't go through with his plan. Unfortunately, Edge is hell-bent on resurrecting Krypton and sends his army to attack Superman. Our Man of Steel tries to get back to Smallville as fast as possible, which admittedly is made easy when your army forgets how to use their heat vision. Trust me, I'm going to get to that problem later. Anyway, in order to get rid of all the Kryptonian consciousnesses at once, including somehow Kyle, who is stuck in a box, Clark takes the Eradicator device into orbit. While still having nobody shooting at him, he releases a solar flare that overcharges the device. Oh, now you decide to shoot at him, giving off a pulse that cures everyone has been affected, but this overloads Superman's powers, causing him to crash and pass out at the fortress. While Clark was out cold, Ed uses a device to enter his mind to try and learn more about Clark and why he is so fond of Earthlings, leading him to threaten his family before knocking him out. However, before anything bad can happen to them, a very worn out Superman arrives and agrees to submit to Edge as long as he leaves his family alone. Edge then takes Superman to his own fortress in the middle of the desert to use the Eradicator on him to bring back General Zod. Meanwhile, due to Clark's last request, Lois makes a call to John Irons, telling him that Superman has turned. She wants him to try and help Superman, as she knows from Kyle that it is possible to fight back against the control. But John Irons has full intentions on killing him. It isn't until he sees Clark struggling to fight back against Zod that he decides to not go through with it. Do not let that bastard take you away from your family. You remember who you are. You fight back, damn it! Edge, realizing what has happened, brings the Eradicator into space for one final gambit. He still ends up getting captured, but the Eradicator is nowhere to be seen. With Edge detained at the DoD, everyone in Smallville tries to get back to some form of normalcy. Even Sam wants to get rid of the majority of their kryptonite weapons after seeing Superman fight against the mind control. Which, for the record, is incredibly stupid because how do you know you won't need these weapons again? That would be like after we dropped a 25 kill streak on Japan, we just stopped producing weapons. We attacked three boats, they dropped the sun on us twice. <laughs> Luckily, Clark disagrees with this decision, and we learned why through him opening up to Lois. Clark, I'm all about backup plans, but this one comes with major risks, and for a reason you've proven isn't a threat. That's not entirely true. My dad's helped me control. I have been controlling my powers every second of every day for almost 40 years years but when zod took over for the first time i felt what it was like to let go i'm not saying i want this to be true i wish it wasn't but it felt good it felt really really good and that feeling worries me if there is even the slightest chance that i could be manipulated again with that desire to let go the world needs a way to stop me this scene ends up showing us a lot about Clark's character, as he is self-aware enough to know how much of a threat he could be and doesn't want the Earth to be defenseless. 
he's willing to take the risk of having all those weapons out there if it meant the world will be safer. However, those exact same weapons are about to be used a lot sooner rather than later, because as a result of Edge's final gambit, he has become the Eradicator, making him immune to Kryptonite, gaining the powers to manually put Kryptonian consciousnesses into other people, and allowing him to escape the DoD. After charging himself in the sun, Edge, his assistant, and a few new subjects lure Superman, John Irons, and Lois to Metropolis. After a long fight and a near-death experience from Lois, all the Kryptonians get detained by the DoD. However, Edge manages to escape to Smallville, where he kidnaps Jordan. He then proceeds to put his father's consciousness, Zeta Ro, inside him. This devastates Clark and Lois, especially when it seems like Clark has found him, only for it to be a trap. Zeta Ro is just keeping Clark busy while Edge puts their final plan into motion, which is to revive the Kryptonian Defense Council and have them guard Edge as he uses the mines to attempt to resurrect Krypton. So Superman, Lois, and John Irons come up with a strategy to use the solar tech in Steel's hammer in order to stop Edge, while Lois will use the same device Edge used on Superman to enter Jordan's mind and free him from Zeta Rose control. So Superman and John Irons go to the mines and incapacitate Jordan as fast as possible to bring him to Lois. She enters his mind and after some resistance, manages to give Jordan the strength he needs to free himself. Not strong, Mom. You're stronger than any of us. You find that strength to come back to us. I know you can do it, baby. Back with Superman, he's taking out the guards and is holding down Edge so John Irons can get one final shot in. He then flings his hammer. And nails him. Edge may be alive, but the Eradicator is gone for good. The season ends with Smallville coming together to fix up the town, the Kents having a funeral for Jor-El after Edge destroyed his crystal, and a surprise visit from someone who is out of this earth. Throughout that entire explanation I just gave, every episode played a part, and built off of each other very well. You never feel like you are given pointless information, and this all comes down to the plot being very consistent, with a few exceptions. The Eradicator is probably the best example of this, and I want to take this time to commend the writers, because this sole device could have been a gigantic plot disaster if not written well. But any questions about this device can be answered fairly easily. For example, on my second viewing, I was curious on how they were able to pick specific Kryptonian consciousnesses, like being able to put Lara's inside Alana. But the show never establishes that the device was random, so it really doesn't contradict anything. Plus the doctor that Edge got to help him was an expert in genetics and molecular neurochemistry. So it's not such a big stretch to believe that he could figure something out. A natural follow-up question would be if Edge was able to pick consciousnesses, why didn't he revive the Defense Council sooner? Well, that was answered during a flashback to Edge's past. The revival of the Defense Council was Zeta Rose's plan. But once Edge has a falling out with him after he lied about Superman, it would make sense that he would try to do things on his own as a way to prove his father wrong. I'll find another way. Now listen to me. I don't need to do this your way, father. My way is the only way. No! However, while the Eradicator is mostly well written, there is potentially a big question that hasn't been answered. That being, how does transferring consciousness give these people powers? In the show, they try to establish that it's because of the ex-Kryptonite. But then, why is it that when the consciousness disappear, so does the powers? On top of that, we have characters like Tag, who got powers without needing a consciousness. I don't know, but the show definitely had to explain that better, or at all for that matter, as it is a big plot convenience. However, the biggest inconsistency in Superman and Lois is actually something that helps the show more than it hurts it. That being, it pretty much has no connection to the broader Arrowverse. Now when I say that, I don't mean this is on another Earth. I mean the show tries its best to not reference the other shows. The most we get is an appearance from Diggle, and it doesn't even play a major role in the episode he's in. I am willing to bet my firstborn child that this lack of connection to the Arrowverse is solely because of the show Supergirl. Because that show has completely different side effects for Kryptonite, has family members of Superman that would be pretty interested in what is happening in Smallville right now, and on top of that, Supergirl established an entire city from Krypton is currently out in space and thriving. 
hell in that show? Clark has gone there before, so he has the knowledge of it. Superman and Lois inherently contradict Supergirl, and I think the writers knew that. You could watch this show with no knowledge of the broader universe, and it will actually make more sense than if you took it into account. Edge may have joined Superman if he was told about Argo, Superman would be dead when he was stabbed with the kryptonite, and their fortresses don't even look remotely similar when they're supposed to be the same place. Honestly, it's best when watching this show to forget about the Arrowverse, and just imagine it as a different Earth. But, I want to be fair, so unfortunately, this is a huge flaw I had to bring up. But, while the show's lack of consistency with the Arrowverse doesn't hurt it in the grand scheme of things, one thing that definitely toes that line is Superman's power level. For a character as strong as the Man of Steel, it is extremely important to keep his strength under control, as to not make him an automatic win button, but not have him lose under stupid circumstances. For the most part, the show keeps a very good balance. Superman incorporates all his powers into his fighting style, uses the right one depending on the situation, and isn't too irresponsible with them. There are a few exceptions though, like this entrance in episode 9 could have definitely injured a few bystanders, or in this flashback, when Superman is fighting a racist and stops a grenade by using his f***ing heat vision. For those of you who don't know how a grenade works, basically inside its iron casing is a spring striker that when set off, sparks the detonator leading to the explosion. So you would think the last thing to do when trying to stop a live grenade from exploding would be to add more heat. I mean, come on Clark, you got frost breath, get your sh** together. However, by far Superman's most inconsistent powers are his heat vision and his speed. For the heat vision, the problem actually comes from everyone besides Clark that uses it, because for some reason, everyone else has to wait 10 goddamn years before their heat vision is charged enough to be released. Look at episode 10 for a perfect example of this. Clark is able to use his heat vision within seconds, while Edge's army takes a full minute of being on Superman's ass before anyone shoots. But Superman's speed has to be the most baffling thing to me. For almost the entire season, and for the majority of the show, Superman is at a reasonable speed. He is fast, but he's not so fast that he can be everywhere at once. However, for just one episode, his top speed was increased drastically. For context, Jonathan has set off the security system inside John Iron's van, and the defenses are about to kill him on a countdown. Luckily, Lois was around to hear his screams of terror and called Superman for help. Now, Superman is currently at the DoD which let's assume is in Metropolis, based on the fact that it seems as if they have the most resources there. He was able to get to Smallville and save Jonathan in seven seconds. That is ridiculously fast. To get from Metropolis to Smallville, Kansas would put Clark at 1,668,840 miles per hour, which is 2,000 times faster than the speed of sound. How did I come up with these numbers, you may be wondering? Well, if we take a moment to look at this map of the Arrowverse and be in f***ing awe at how far Metropolis is from Kansas. This also means that earlier in the season, Lois must have taken a plane or something when she just casually went to Metropolis in episode 2. God, the more I look at this map, the more annoyed I get. Bottom line, this scene makes Superman extremely fast for no reason, and he never reaches speeds like this again, so why even do something like this? Also, DC, just move Smallville out of Kansas or Metropolis closer to it because it will make my life so much easier. Now, while Superman and Lois seem to have problems with the Man of Steel's powers, they actually nail the consistency with his weaknesses. Each one is established with strict rules that the writers stick to. For example, Green Kryptonite is only able to pierce through Kryptonians, Red Solar Light Energy can neutralize a Kryptonian's power set, and Sound can be weaponized to immobilize them. This is actually cleverly used in episode 4, where a villain uses high frequency sounds that only Superman can hear to throw him off his trail, and later as a weapon. Granted, I have no idea how this man snuck up on Superman, but either way, it's still smart how they were able to make this guy a threat to our hero when he has no powers. Honestly, having strict rules for a character's weaknesses is just as important as having them for their powers, as in breaking those rules can lead to your character being seemingly invincible. I mean, look at all the damage Natasha takes in Black Widow. She should be dead 10 times over, but the writers practically gave her no weaknesses that a normal human would have. Now, I've gone on a lot about the plot and the world building of this show, so 
I think it's finally time that we start talking about the part that truly shines in Superman and Lois, the characters. I adore the characters in this show. While their dialogue does sometimes suffer from CWisms, every character is well developed, fleshed out, and consistent. Let's start off with looking at our main villain, Morgan Edge, a businessman and a Kryptonian who wants to resurrect Krypton even though it would destroy humanity. Now I must say, it feels really good to actually have an intelligent villain again on the CW. Between the Alices, the Godspeeds, and the Black Masks, I almost forgot what it was like to have a competent antagonist. Every action Edge makes is believable, especially when taking into account his character. He's a very tactical man, always making sure he's putting himself in the most advantageous positions. Examples of this can be seen in his purchase of the Daily Planet as a way to control his public perception. When he needed subjects to put Kryptonian consciousnesses into, he gave Lana a job as a head recruiter for Edge Corp, as she's a very trusted person within the community, and he just presents himself to the people of Smallville as a man who wants to help the town succeed, and is willing to give enough jobs to see that through. This is very intelligent, and it makes sense why the people who have been struggling for so long would be open to accept help from someone like Edge. And every time Lois tries to expose him to the townspeople, Edge is prepared and able to take everything she throws at him and Uno reverse that shit right back at her. Even with his Kryptonian origin, he doesn't reveal anything that would give someone like Lois the idea that he isn't human, and only does so when he feels like it's the best time. Speaking of his background as a Kryptonian, I really like how the writers made Edge's origin be a reflection of Clark's. Instead of landing near a family that would love and raise him, Edge was immediately met with hostility, fear, and was experimented on. It's no wonder why his view on humans are so cold and full of anger, and why he is so surprised that Superman would choose humanity over his home planet. This choice was also the last straw for Edge, as with no chance of having his half-brother by his side, he pushes forward with Zeta Rose's original plan and becomes the Eradicator. Edge could have easily done this once he initially found the device, but when he discovered that he has a half-brother on Earth, he decided to try and resurrect Krypton his own way, as a last ditch effort to preserve that pure Kryptonian bloodline. All I wanted was a family, Cal. You had it. We were brothers. All these decisions make sense and are backed up with prior experiences. That's what really makes not just a great villain like Morgan Edge, but a great character overall. As we continue going over each character, you'll notice that every action they take have reasons, and not bull reasons like Natasha's justification for exploding a child that doesn't add up when you put a second of thought into it, but actual reasons that are backed up by their character and history. Probably the person they give the most justifications for their actions is John Irons. You're not the man of steam. I am. On his earth, he was married to Lois and had a kid named Natalie. However, after their Superman turned and killed Lois in front of them, John Iron and his daughter go to work in building a war suit to combat the Kryptonian, with a few extra touches. So I can be out there with you and you're kicking ass. Unfortunately, before the suit could be finished, John Iron's one chance to take down Superman came, and he sprung into action. This ensuing fight ends with him being brought to this Earth, leaving him with no wife, no daughter, and no home. Ignoring his tragic past, as I said before during the first episode, John Iron's character is a little contradictory. I'm telling you, he could have killed Superman right there. But besides that, he became the most improved character throughout the season. The flashbacks gave a great insight into why he initially wanted to kill the Man of Steel. And I like how he only starts to change when he begins to open up to this world's lowest lane. Hands down though, John Iron's shining moment is when he helps Clark fight off Zod's control. What makes it so good is the writers don't make it so that one speech was enough to change his mind on killing Clark. It takes several talks with several characters, and even then, it isn't until he sees Clark struggle with his own eyes that he changes his mind. Lois sent me to help you. She still believes in you. I met your boys, and they believe in you too. I know what it means to lose the people you love. That pain you feel right now, that is nothing compared to what happens if you lose them. Right now, you got a chance to fight. Do not let that bastard take you away from your family. It makes perfect sense that the only thing to stop John Irons from killing Superman was seeing the one thing he never saw in the Man of Steel on his Earth. Humanity. 
Now, while I do believe John Irons had the most improvement throughout the season, that doesn't mean he's the best character. Now, he's not bad, but characters like the Kents are leaps and bounds better. Clark and his family are the heart of the show, and their dynamic is probably the most wholesome and heartwarming thing I've seen in a piece of comic book media in a while. Let's start with looking at the kids, Jonathan and Jordan. I already mentioned their differences in personalities, but what I didn't mention is that the show uses this to initially fake out who has powers. Throughout the entire first episode, there are enough hints to lead the audience to believe that Jonathan was going to be the one with powers. From his athletic abilities, to his upbeat attitude, to even sharing the name with Clark's only son in the comics. However, the show ends up subverting her expectations by giving the powers to Jordan. God, I cannot say that phrase without cringing. Anyway, unlike certain movies, Superman and Lois doesn't just give us a twist for the fun of it. The writers actually use this new dynamic to flesh out the story and characters. Look at Jonathan, for example. Jordan getting these powers is what causes their family to move to Smallville, leaving behind everything Jonathan knows. He's now in unmarked territory. He feels like he doesn't belong. He feels like Jordan did for so many years. Now he does get mad at Jordan at first, and eventually reaches the point to where he gets so fed up, he asks his dad if he can leave home to go back to Metropolis. However, even with all of this anger and confusion towards Smallville, he never blames Jordan. A little sibling spat here and there, but it is never dragged on, and at the end of the day, Jonathan is always looking out for Jordan. Even though they are twins, he plays the role of a big brother. If Jordan is feeling down or self-doubt, he's there to pick him back up. He encourages him to keep working with his powers, even after he is initially told by Jor-El that he has very little potential, and just overall wants to see Jordan happy. He gets some great scenes to back this up, like when he helps Jordan start to control his strength, or takes a superpower punch from him to prevent him from doing something he would regret. But by far the scene that best demonstrates Jonathan's character is when he helps Jordan stay on the football team. For context, in this episode, the boys find out that Clark has been using his super hearing to eavesdrop on them, and it feels like a violation on not just their privacy, but their trust. Even after Clark apologizes, Jordan is still feeling rubbed the wrong way, so to put his new powers to some use and get a little revenge on a couple of bullies, he joins the football team. Jonathan becomes concerned as he is worried about Jordan accidentally hurting someone, and once Clark finds out, he feels the exact same way, pretty much forbidding Jordan from playing on the team. Now, Jonathan could have just let this play out and take back the title of being the only athlete in the family. But after a talk with Jordan, he goes to defend him to his dad. What if Jordan joining the team wasn't a mistake? Maybe Jordan needs football. I appreciate you sticking up no, for your brother. No, look, it's, it's not even like that. You should have seen him out there. He's making friends. He's been happy for the first time in forever. There's nothing I want more than for you guys to be happy. But we have to be careful. I know that... Having powers is a total game changer, but what's the point of having something special if you're not actually allowed to be special? This is what I love about Jonathan. Even with being the one without powers, he still tries his best to protect Jordan, and his arc in finding where he belongs in Smallville and as a powerless son of Superman is done very well. Jordan too is incredibly well written and goes on probably the best arc of the show. Unlike Jonathan, he didn't lose much when he moved to Smallville. In fact, he gained a good friend in Sarah. For the first time, there was someone who could relate to him on a deeper level, so he adapted to the town a lot faster than Jonathan. I mean, I rebelled against my mom by quitting cheer and you and your whole football thing. I actually kind of like being on the team. Really? It's good to be good at something. I like it here. Feels like for the first time in a while, I'm happy. Maybe it's because got really lucky with the company you keep. However, he still suffers from massive anxiety and is constantly worried he's going to hurt someone with his powers, especially after breaking his brother's wrist. But over time, with the help of his friends and family, Jordan starts to gain more confidence, pushing himself out of his comfort zone, having more control over his powers, and even being there for Jonathan, despite the fact that he got drunk and messed up his date with Sarah. Jordan and Jonathan are some of the most fleshed out characters in the show, and their bond is one of the highlights. No matter what little spat they got into, or how disconnected they may have felt, they are always there for each other, and it's genuinely one of the most heartwarming relationships in the show. You realize that you're pretty much the only person I have here, right? I don't even know where to begin. Whatever happened, we're together, alright? Jordan, I know what happened in the barn. 
Those poles fell on us, and you saved our lives. So honestly, I, I really, I don't care what some stupid hologram said. Something happened to you, definitely something special. And if no one else is going to help you figure out what that is, I will. Now, I think it's about time we finally get to talking about our two title characters, starting with Lois Lane. I adore this character. She's understanding, smart, and she finally gave us a well-written reporter in the Arrowverse. Yeah, the CW has others, but they either bring down the plot like Iris, or the reporting barely plays a part in the overall story like Kara. This show makes Lois's reporting plotline integral to the story. While Clark is helping Jordan with his powers, Lois is the one digging into Morgan Edge. When you think about it, the season can actually be divided into two halves. The second half is Superman vs Kryptonian Edge, but the first half is Lois vs Businessman Edge. Every time she tries to get a little closer to the story, he is there to attempt to derail her. Like buying the Daily Planet so he can rewrite her story, serving her cease and desist papers, and even trying to blow her ass up. However, no matter what Edge throws at Lois or how much the town disagrees with her going after him, she keeps pushing forward with the story. When Edge uses his power at the planet to silence her, she quits and goes to work at the Smallville Gazette. When she was told Edge would sue her, she threatened to counter sue. And when her car blew up, she just used their other car. Yeah, not as cool as the other points. Anyway, one thing I noticed is that Lois doesn't actually change much during the season. In fact, rather than a traditional character arc, her and Clark have flat arcs throughout the story. For those of you who don't know, a flat arc is when instead of the world changing a character, the character changes and affects the world around them, while staying relatively the same throughout the story. Now, if you're writing a flat arc for a character, you need to make sure that the audience can see the impact this person is creating with the world around them. Otherwise, you can get an example like Captain Marvel, who doesn't go through changing herself and isn't the catalyst for changing any other character. However, Superman and Lois actually does something interesting with this flat arc concept. The show has each parent have a major effect on the kid who they weren't as close to at the start of the story. Let me explain. In Lois's case, that's Jonathan. In the flashback at the start of the season, we can see that she definitely gave Jordan much more of her attention, which led to Jonathan having a pretty good connection with Clark. Now that Jordan has powers, Jonathan finds himself looking to Lois to help him figure out what his place is in the family full of supers. The best episode that encapsulates this relationship between the two is episode 8, Holding the Wrench. This episode is kinda crazy. In it, John and Irons is locked up at a DoD prison, and Superman is trying to get information from him, while Lois investigates his van with Jonathan. During this search, we learn about John Irons' daughter Natalie. But more importantly, we learned that after the twins were born, Lois was pregnant with a girl. But unfortunately, she lost the baby. And her name was gonna be Natalie. Yeah, when I first watched this episode, I was stunned that this was the route they went down. We are shown how this event affects Lois through her therapy session and anger towards Jonathan's actions in this episode. After finding out about Natalie, all those feelings of loss and fear came rushing back to her, and it definitely didn't help that Jonathan decided to investigate the van on his own, almost leading to his death if Superman's speed was actually consistent. This causes Lois to snap hard at Jonathan, calling him reckless and stupid for going alone. But after a nice therapy session where Lois opens up about how she feels responsible for losing the baby, she apologized to Jonathan and explains herself. When you and your brother were about 18 months old, I got pregnant. <laughs> I ended up losing the baby, so it's really not something I talk about much. We were gonna name her Natalie. And then I'm just being reminded of the child that I lost and then almost losing you. And I said some things I never should have said and that I didn't mean. John, if there's anyone in this family who gets what you're going through, it's me. I know what it's like to be in the orbit of someone who can juggle semi-trucks. We are the extraordinary humans in a family of super people. And we have to stick together. This is what I love about Lois in this show. She's tough, persistent, and smart, but also loving, understanding, and hopeful. And we get to see all those traits and more put on full display when she's with our lead character. That's right, it's finally time to talk about Clark Kent, aka Superman. Thanks cool costume. Thanks. My mom made it for me. This has to be one of the best versions of Superman I have ever seen. 
I mean, compared to Man of Steel, this one is miles ahead, and I think a lot of that comes down to three decisions made by the writers. The first one has to be making Clark a father. It's such a fresh take on the character, and the execution was spot on. His effect on Jordan was the highlight of the show. In the first episode, the two are very disconnected from each other, no matter how hard Clark tries to fix that connection. Having the kids find out his secret identity and Jordan getting powers was probably the best thing for their relationship. Throughout the season, we see Jordan start to slowly understand his father, and why he needs to always be in control of his powers. These new abilities and the responsibility that comes with them will always be something these two share. The best example of this can be seen in episode 6, Broken Trust. Here the boys have a football game against Metropolis, and Jordan in particular is really looking forward to this game, as he sees it as an opportunity to show the kids from his old school how much he has changed. This episode actually is full of great moments between Clark and Jordan, like when Clark reels him in after Jordan starts taunting the player he just laid out, or having Jordan release some built up energy into his hand when he can't hold it in. But the highlight of this episode has to be towards the end, when Jordan, Jonathan, and their teammates are confronted by the Metropolis high school team. One of the players keeps egging on Jordan, trying to bait him into throwing a punch. Now, this scene runs parallel with a Superman scene. Basically, this kid Tag, who got powers earlier in the season, has escaped from where he was being held at the DoD. And throughout the entire search, Sam keeps referring to him as a weapon instead of a kid. So even after Superman tells the DoD to stand down, and they still end up using live rounds mixed with kryptonite on Tag, it needless to say really pisses off our Man of Steel. Both of these scenes have our characters pushed into action, but while Superman restrains himself, Jordan doesn't and swings at the kid. Luckily Jonathan was there to block the punch so Jordan doesn't do something he regrets, but this leads into a discussion where Clark reinforces how important it is for them to keep their powers in check. I told you, your powers come with responsibility, and I need you to get that. Because you made a big point at the hotel of saying you're different from me. That anger you felt that made you want to use your powers the way you did tonight, I have those feelings too. Do? Yes, but I keep them in check. Otherwise, I risk losing the trust of the very people I've sworn to protect. 20 years later, every time I use my powers, that trust is tested. Every time. Like the thing about trust, Jordan, once you break it, it takes a lot longer to heal than a wrist. Making Clark a father allowed the writers to put him in situations that has never been done before, and they did a great job at having Lois and Clark help guide the kids in the right direction. But I can't go any longer without talking about the relationship between Lois and Clark. These two have quickly become my favorite couple in the Arrowverse, and a lot of that has to do with the respect they have for each other they understand their lines of work and the risks that come with it. For example, in episode 4, Haywire, the town is about to vote on whether to give Morgan Edge access to the mines or not. Lois knows her showing up would do nothing, as she has grown a reputation of wanting to take Edge down. So she asks Clark if he can make an appearance and say a few things. He agrees, but ends up breaking that agreement, as he had to suit up to look for a high-risk escape villain. Lois is upset about this, but it makes her feel selfish. She knows Clark always has good reasons for breaking a promise or missing something because he is out saving lives. The most she does is let Clark know that she feels like she has been at the bottom of his priorities as of late. But she doesn't do it out of anger or frustration, rather understanding because she respects what Clark does as Superman. However, at the end of the episode, Clark still tries to make it up to Lois, so she knows that even though he's constantly leaving, her and their family will always be priorities in his life. See, now you're just spoiling me. Well, you deserve to be spoiled. To know, beyond any doubt, no matter what's going on, what I'm up against. But this, my time with you, is what gets me through everything else. My first thought of the day, and my last thought at night. And I love you. This is what I love about these two characters. They have such a respect for each other, and it makes it so one doesn't outshine the other. They are a team, and the show makes sure we know that. The second reason I believe that this version of Superman was so well received is the writers were able to give him flaws without destroying his character. Superman in this show has a lot of insecurities. Yeah, he's got the Superman thing down, but trying to juggle that and being in his family's life is a constant struggle for him. 
As the season progresses, we get to see Clark overcome those insecurities by opening up to his kids. In reality, his decision to keep his secret identity away from the boys is what made it hard to connect with them in the first place, as he's constantly putting up a front to keep his secrets. Having this revealed allowed Clark to be 100% real with his family, and reconnect with them in a way he never expected. We can see the difference by comparing how he tries to talk to the boys in the first episode to later ones. He starts off extremely stiff and uptight, but later progresses into being loose and open, which all can be seen within his body language. <laughs> um, that. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, hi high school starts tomorrow. You, uh, you nervous? Did I, did I ever tell you about the time I was the team manager of the football? Everyone duct taped you to a tractor. Life's a little different in the Smallville than it is Metropolis. See? Jonathan, I told you I know how you feel, and I do. When I was just a couple years older than you, I did leave home. That time that I gave up with my mom, I never got it back, and she sacrificed it for me. When I was in ninth grade, I wanted to try out for the baseball team. My dad didn't let me. So you never even tried out? I came close. So did you regret not playing? Yeah, I did. Which is why I need you to be very honest with me. Is playing football something that you really want? However, I think the shining trait that really brings this version of Superman together is his capacity for hope. Clark is such a positive influence to not just his family, but everyone in Smallville. We see this at the start of episode 5, The Best of Smallville. Clark is ecstatic that it's time for the Harvest Festival. Basically, it's this big event where the people come together to give and help each other. It's one of Clark's favorite time in Smallville, as it reminds him of the lessons and morals that his family taught him growing up, and gives him time to reflect on all the sacrifices they made for him when he was younger. By the end of the episode, the town even commemorates Martha and all the good she did by giving her a bench in the middle of the town. After all these years, Clark knows the people of Smallville are some of the most giving and helpful people around. Even in later episodes, when it seems as if the town is falling apart, Clark believes in the people to pull through and be there for each other. Now that my mom's gone, you're the heart of Smallville. You are. But Smallville's gone. So stay. And help rebuild it. Even with John Irons and Morgan Edge, two people that were his enemies, Clark extends an olive branch to them, believing that each person has the capacity for good. It may not have worked out for Edge, but his compassion did help foster a great relationship with John Irons. This same hope is what gave him the strength to fight back against Zod's consciousness trying to take control of his body, and is also a defining feature of the Kent family. They all have so much love and hope for each other, that whenever one of them starts to lose it, there will always be someone to help bring them back up. This family always has each other's backs, and it's what makes their relationship truly heartwarming. Clark, you and I brought the boys into the superhero world, and I wasn't sure it was the right thing to do, but I have seen how capable they've become. They're strong, like their father. Like their mother. Well, that's it, right? Video done? It seemed as if I've covered everything. Well, there is actually one more character in the show that I haven't talked about yet. That being Smallville itself. The show makes the town feel like a living, breathing character, and it's where everything comes together thematically. The town actually goes through a pretty big character arc as we get to see it through the eyes of Lana's family. These characters are straight up some of my favorite in the Arrowverse. At the start of the show, this family is at a pretty low point. Lana and Kyle don't see eye to eye anymore, and Sarah is growing more apart from them every day. This family's arc actually runs parallel to the Kents, in a very interesting way. As we see the Kents' bond get better, we also witness Lana's family's bond get worse. We're shown Kyle's problems with alcohol, leading him to not always being there when his kids need him. Sarah has lost faith in her father, and Lana is just trying to keep everything together. Now like I said earlier, the show doesn't put the full blame on Kyle, as we see several times him just trying to do right by his family. He thinks having Edge here would truly help everyone, so he doesn't notice when Edge is making Lana uncomfortable. He tries not to drink, but something keeps bringing him back in, and when he finally makes a permanent change, he has used up all of his chances with Sarah. However, this doesn't stop him, as we get to see his determination to want to change and be there for his family again. However, just when things seem to be going well for this family, Morgan Edge's attack on Smallville makes things 
10 times worse, especially after everyone gets freed from the Kryptonian mind control. The town ends up putting all the blame on Kyle and his family, as they were the ones who pushed so hard for Edge to come to Smallville in the first place, even going as far as to vandalize their house. However, after everything his family has gone through, they have become stronger, and even in this dark time, they are not going to lose that bond again. And the show continues to test this. Kyle gets put on leave for his job, Sarah's getting crap from the kids at school, and their family is even planning on moving. However, they don't let that keep them down. They attacked our home. And we're gonna fix it. Huh? Okay, huh? No, look, okay, all we did is try and help. Dad. Huh? No, we come in with the best of intentions, and everyone now just assumes the absolute worst, okay? We can't go into town without getting harassed, and now I can't even keep my family safe. This is- Kyle, look at me. What those people think, they're wrong, and they will figure it out, okay? Okay, the only thing I care about is us. And we are gonna get through this together as a family. Okay. Okay. As their bond is getting stronger, Smallville is suffering. More and more businesses are having to close down due to the DOD being set up in town. Edge is nowhere to be found, and nobody knows what's going on. Smallville has become unrecognizable from what we witnessed during the Harvest Festival, and this all comes to a head when Edge tries to execute his final plan, causing earthquakes throughout the town. With everyone in a panic, Lana's family is left with a choice. That's how we can go. So we can stay and help. We stay and help. We help. These actions inspire Smallville, leading to everyone coming together again to protect each other. And once the disaster is over, they work to rebuild what they have lost. Smallville is home to a bunch of amazing characters, some of which I can't include at the risk of sounding repetitive. But... Seeing this family start off in such a bad place and going on that journey with them to rebuild that bond is just a fantastic arc along with seeing the people of Smallville fall only to pick themselves back up together. These are the ideals this show is choosing to prop up. Helping each other when you are in need, how to build strong bonds, not judging someone based on preconceived notions, and just having understanding and compassion for each other. Smallville is just as important to this show as Superman himself. As through it, we see people, even in the darkest of times, find it in themselves to help their fellow man. What would you say to the people of the world when asked what you stand for? I'd like to think everything good and decent. Truth. Justice. The American way. Superman and Lois is one of the best shows I have watched in a while, and is probably my favorite in the Arrowverse. It isn't perfect, and it has a few inconsistencies and plot conveniences, but the good definitely outweighs the bad. The character work is top notch, the plot is pretty solid, and the way the writers tied everything together thematically was done beautifully and has possibly created a contender for a definitive version of Superman. The show is leaps and bounds better than anything DC has put out on the CW, and they did it with solid characters, a strong plot, and most importantly, great writing. Now. During my videos, I try to be as fair and as objective as possible, and I think I've done that here. This means I really don't get to talk about how a show makes me feel most of the time. I sprinkle it in here and there, but it's really not my focus. But if you'll indulge me for a couple minutes, I'd like to go how you say a um, full video essayist for a second. <clears throat> I love Superman and Lois because it's a hopeful show. Something that was created under the belief that when the chips are down, people will help each other. Nowadays, it feels like we are all so quick to go at each other's throats. And don't get me wrong, I love some good sh talking and a slight bit of toxicity. I mean, I'm a Call of Duty player. That is in my blood. What? I, I can't be him, you dog shit. But so often, we are quick to judge others when we don't know anything about them. We barely allow redemption anymore. And on top of that, we try to put ourselves on a moral high ground as if we are all perfect. Guess what? We're f not. And Superman and Lois point that out every episode. Each character is flawed in their own way, and they end up growing through compassion, understanding, and letting people make mistakes. Now is this idealistic and impossible? Most likely. But it's something to strive for, and that's fine. We're all assholes in our own messed up way. But I believe that when push comes to shove, people truly try to do the best they can to be there for each other. And that is what Superman represents. 
he's the best of us and gives us something to reach for. It's not impossible because at the end of the day, Clark Kent is just a boy from Kansas. Anyway, I do hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know down in the comment section down below. What do you guys think of Superman and Lois? Did you like it? Did you not? Did I miss a few things? Just let me know all down there. Oh, Christ. This video got delayed to hell. Like, I'm really sorry with how long it took for this video to come out. But I definitely misjudged how, how long it would take to edit something of this size. And I definitely mismanaged my time a few places here and there. Again, sorry for the wait, but now that I've gone through this, I now know how to handle a large video like this, and it definitely will not happen again. Also, big announcement, at the time of this video, or at least around the time this video ends, there will be a poll coming up, and it's gonna be the question on live streaming. Basically, I wanna start live streaming. I wanna start streaming some games to you guys. Maybe we could talk about, about some movies and TV shows on certain in days. I, I wanna start live streaming, but I also want your guys' take on it. So by the time the video is out, there will be a poll. So go vote on it, comment on it, and based on the results, I will be releasing another post to better explain what the situation is going to be. Yeah, I gotta take a day break to like answer comments. I've, I'm have i so behind on responding to comments. <laughs> but yeah, that's it for the CW shows. There's absolutely no other show that I need to cover. We're all fine, we can move to bigger and better things. I'm thinking some MCU. <laughs> I'm not getting out of this, am I? <sighs> yep. Well, next video is going to be on The Flash Season 7. Y'all been wanting it. Y'all been waiting for it. It's finally coming. It is finally happening. And there's definitely going to be absolutely no stress whatsoever. It's not like, like the new season comes out in only a few weeks and I want to get the video done before then. <laughs> huh. Thank you all for the support. Once again, if you guys like the video and you're new to the channel, hit that like and that subscribe button. Also, if you think this channel is potential, hit those same buttons and hit the notification bell so you are always notified when I release new content. Anyway, my name is Gio. Anyway, my name is Gio, and I will talk to you all later. Peace. Bye.